uh, for, those, for that kind introduction. I'm really delighted to be here today and very honoured uh, to take the stage after uh, that exciting, interesting speech by Letitia. I, as I said, I am not a politician. I may have a political title, but 30 years in business, 17 years as a FTSE 100 fi uh, director, I hope I can speak to you as a fellow businessman primarily. And I thought it would actually be appropriate to start with the words of the Nobel laureate Seamus Heaney. And he said, getting started, keeping going, getting started again, in art and in life, it seems to me that this is the essential rhythm, not only of achievement, but of survival. He said in art and in life, frankly, he could and should have said in business as well. Because that is what business has had to do every single day. And frankly, it's what government must do as well. A year ago, President Barroso stood here and talked to you about competitiveness in Europe. He said there could be no return to the old ways. We had to forge ahead with reform. And under the leadership of the Irish Presidency, in the first six months of 2013, the countries of the EU did exactly that. We have made a start in reforms that have the power to significantly improve the life of a half a billion people on this continent. Not least and probably most importantly, the one in four, maybe one in five of people, young people who are currently unemployed. And we must look and think of them. It is now our job to keep going and to build on what we have achieved to date. 2014 is a critical year in reform. In less than 15 weeks' time, we'll be going to the ballot boxes to elect a new European Parliament. And of course, a new European Commission will be appointed. We have a real opportunity to bring about the changes that will help business prosper. And before I go on to talk about the civics, it is worth pausing to look at why this matters in the wider world. Over the last five or six years, while Europe undoubtedly and understandably was concentrating on its own financial and economic crisis, other regions have been on the move. The Indian economy has grown by a third, the Chinese economy by double that, and Africa is now the home to seven out of the ten fastest growing economies in the world. I was in Mexico last week, and they are pushing ahead with a stunning reform package that will transform their economy. At the same time, the Pacific Alliance, of which they are part, of Latin American free trading company, countries, are building a free trade alliance that will stand in contrast with the protectionism of their neighbours. I have every confidence in which alliance and which countries will be shown to be correct. And the EU must heed these lessons. If we are to maintain our standards of living and indeed our, standard of, uh, our standing in the world, we must grow, we must seek a path for growth. As Chancellor Merkel pointed out, Europe accounts for 7% of the world's population. It accounts for a quarter of the world's economy, but pays half of the world's social spending. It is economic growth that pays for that spending, not the spending that creates the growth. We have to live within our means, and we have to pay our way, not least, in fact mostly, by expanding trade and making sure we create an attractive environment across Europe for investment. Governments have spent the last five or six years lecturing business, and we have to admit it with some justification. But I think it's also time now that governments started listening to business about what creates jobs and what creates growth. That's why last year the British Prime Minister, David Cameron, asked a group of senior, senior business leaders to go out and talk to other business leaders all across Europe about what could we do and what should change. The need to tackle regulation was a primary focus of this report. It, of course, welcomed 
the progress made by the Commission in the refit programme, which has reduced regulations to some extent and certainly saved many billions of pounds across Europe. But it called for more and it called for it faster. It used the natty acronym COMPETE. Now what the COMPETE programme is, and I'll tell you what it stands for, was really overall, it was to start to put the burden of proof on the bureaucrats rather than the burden on business. So COMPETE really stood for, first of all, the C, a competitiveness test, to make sure when Europe did something, it looked at the context of how competitive would this make Europe. Secondly, the O, one in, one out. If you put in a new regulation, you take one out. In the UK, we're looking for a one in, two out ratio. Also, to measure the impact. Don't just rely on the commissioners that actually come up with a proposal to talk about the impact. Have an annual review of the impact of total European regulation. Has the burden gone up or gone down? And have an independent body who will look at it. Somebody who will say what the truth is. Also have a proportionality rule, particularly in areas of science where we seem to be so incredibly risk averse. Exemptions for small and micro businesses. The effective burden of so many rules is so much higher to smaller businesses than it is to large corporations. Also create targets for burden, regulation, for burden reduction rather than as it feels sometime targets for burden increases. And finally, to evaluate rules after they go in and make sure that they're actually enforced across Europe properly before we start creating new rules. But it wasn't only about regulation. It was also about trade. They called, for instance, for a rapid progress on TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership. Launching the world's biggest trade partnership was one of the great achievements of the Irish presidency. TTIP could bring up to 120 billion euros to the EU in growth. As Prime Minister Cameron of the UK said, it was a once in a generation opportunity. And we owe it to future generations not to let it fall due to special interests on either side of the Atlantic. The EU has recently concluded a few, well, a few years ago, a free trade agreement with South Korea. To put that in context, UK exports to South Korea alone have doubled since that agreement. We've also recently agreed at a political level a free trade agreement with Canada that will provide many new opportunities for exports. And as a strong exporting nation, Ireland can benefit hugely from the opportunities that will bring. And it's really important to understand and to state, free trade does not just benefit multinationals. It gives huge opportunities to small and medium-sized businesses to grow into markets by taking down the difficult barriers. But also, and hugely importantly, it's good for consumers. It gives better choice to consumers. It gives more competition to consumers. It gives lower prices to consumers. It is vital that as businesses, we all explain the benefits of open and free trade because they are spread among the many and we must counteract the claims of the few who want to shut out competition. And in that vein, our business leaders and business leaders generally want to see a deepening of the single market and services, and the TSAC referred to it. They account for about 70% of our economies but only 20% of inter-EU trade. That alone would help the EU economy grow by about 1.8%. Doing the same for the digital economy, another Irish presidential priority, could add around 4% to EU GDP. At times when we are searching and scratching around for growth, these are enormous numbers and why we must strive to achieve them. The UK government is often portrayed in Europe by what it's against. Let me tell you what we are for. We are passionate about the single market. We are passionate about a union that helps competitiveness. We are passionate about growth and prosperity for all the people of Europe. 
This growth is what we are trying to create in the UK and make it a great place to do business. We are achieving some success. Business startups are growing rapidly. Unemployment is down to just over 7% and falling quickly. We are one of the fastest growing nations in Europe and inflation is at a modest 2%. But there is more to do and businesses round, you, round the world, however, seem to be recognising that something is changing. In the UK last year, 170,000 jobs were created through foreign direct investment. We were the top recipient of FDI in all of Europe. It is telling that we received more investment from China in the last 18 months than in the previous 30 years in aggregate. The more positive business environment is also leading to a bit of a new trend, the reshoring of company operations from outside Europe back into Europe. This is resulting in shorter production lines, shorter delivery times, enabling business to respond more quickly to changing demand. This can help keep costs down, respond more quickly uh, to consumers, and enable farms to monitor quality far more easily. But if this trend is to take hold, governments have to assure our business environment is competitive. In my own previous business experience, I brought thousands of jobs back to Europe from around the world, but it required agreements with unions for flexibility. The net result was actually more union membership, more full-time job, good, well-paid, well-trained jobs. We need to see more of that. And I think Ireland and the UK are together in a lot of these things. It is interesting to see we are among the leading EU nations in rankings such as the World Bank Ease of Doing Business report. And we have economies that are heavily interlinked. Economies that benefit from a flow of people, goods, investment, capital, on an I and ideas on a scale that is rare even in today's interconnected economy. I welcome the fact there's more than 40,000 Irish directors of UK companies. That's the highest number of any country in the world. Every single week, we exchange 1 billion euros of trade. And it's not just about bilateral trade. In addition to being major investors in each other's countries, we are working together to win third-party business from other countries. As we speak, the first joint Irish-British Irish -British trade mission is at the Singapore Air Show, selling what our countries can do together. And of course, these trade links are underpinned by ever closer political relationships. We are looking forward immensely to the state visit in April by President Higgins. And of course, the annual uh, get-together between our two, our two prime ministers is going to happen again this year in March, and they've been very successful. Given this close relationship and our overlapping interests, the UK and Ireland must continue to work closely together to, to reshape the reform agenda in Europe, building on the success of the Irish presidency and by listening to business. I will end by making a request. As business leaders, I ask you to speak out about the sort of Europe you want to see. Is it an inward-looking, burdened, fortress Europe heading downwards? Or is it a competitive, innovative Europe trading around the world and bringing prosperity to all of our citizens? I urge you as businesses to make your voice heard. Thank you very much.